everyone. I'm going to be just in just a few minutes, in about a minute, I'm going to just start talk on ear infections and talking about the truth with what's going on with ear infections. Why are our kiddos uh, struggling with chronic ear infections and resorting to multiple ear um, antibiotics, um, sets of ear tubes, and no answers? So I'm here to help provide um, answers to really what's going on with that. So uh, let's actually get started. So ear infections, it's really, that's a symptom. And that's, it's more than just an ear infection, right? So we'll touch up on that. And to, I'm not here to provide opinions for anyone. I'm here to provide facts for you parents, most likely that are watching this. So getting into it, um, I am, I'm a doctor, I'm a chiropractor, um, but Latin root of uh, doctor means teacher. So I am here to educate my parents um, and my patients about their health and really what's going on with them to get them back to where they want to be and not just where they want to be, where they need to be and not just giving them kind of um, a thing to just help with the symptoms, but truly address the issue. So leading into that, um, there's a lot of things that are involved with ear infections. And I just want to go over some statistics uh, first before we dig into kind of um, what's truly going on. So um, some stats that I know of back from 2006. Now you can imagine that the stats that I'm going to give you are probably significantly increased since 2006. Um, because we're facing a lot more of these issues. But in 2006, over 9 million kids got an ear infection, and which 8 million of them actually got a prescription for that ear infection. 85% of kids have at least one ear infection before they're at least three years old. Uh, so by that stat, you would consider ear infections to be a normal thing, right? Well, I've Ear infections aren't normal. They're very common, obviously, by 85% of kids actually struggling with them, but they aren't a normal process. Um, just with ear infections and the cost of them, it cost, just in the United States, $2.8 billion. Billion, not a million, but a billion dollars in medical expenses, which over a third of that was just paid out of your own pocket. So the medical community, hospitals, they thank you. Um, it's also the most common reason kids see their pediatrician or go to the ER. So if you think about it, it's also probably the most common reason that you as a parent are having to call into work and miss work. Um, so that's not just creating stress for that kid, but it's also creating stress in your professional life aspect too. It's also the most common reason antibiotics are being prescribed. Again, out of 9 million kids that got an ear infection in 2006, 8 million of them got a prescription. What do you think that prescription was? An antibiotic. So when we talk about that, we're going to go a little bit further into at least some misconceptions about ear infections. So first misconception is that ear infections are a normal process. I already talked about how they're not a normal process at all. Uh, the next misconception is that it's because as a kid, your kid has a horizontal ear canal. And that's why they're there to blame because they're not vertical, so the ear can't drain. Well, let me ask you this. Can you do a handstand and still swallow food? Yes, because gravity does not play a part at all when it comes to the drainage of the ears. Um, there's actually a muscle, which I'll talk a lot about in a little bit, that actually is responsible for draining those ear canals. So again, your kids' horizontal ear canals have no uh, part in them getting ear infections. And also that infections, ear infections are bacteria. Well, most of them actually are viral. So, um, and we'll talk about kind of why that's an issue in itself. Um, if most ear infections are viral, if they're not bacterial. So now just 
touch up on a few things. Um, they actually did a study in 2007. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics did a study in 2007 uh, where they, they changed their guidelines for ear infections um, to watchful waiting. So what that means is that they know that most ear infections, um, the symptoms will go away after so, for after so long. So to wait it out and not prescribe anything or treat that. Um, so they did a survey on pediatricians and they found that 85% of the pediatricians actually agreed with that guideline. But they did a follow-up uh, survey three years later that actually found that only 15, 15%, one five, actually followed those new guidelines. What does that mean? It means that 85% of pediatricians were not waiting. They were just prescribing an antibiotic. And the thing is, is um, antibiotics, they only kill bacteria. So if that ear infection, which again, most are, are gonna be viral, is a viral infection, that antibiotic is not gonna do anything for that ear infection. So then what happens is that kid just gets another ear infection, another antibiotic, another ear infection, another antibiotic. And because we're not, they're not testing to actually see if it's a bacterial or a viral, they're just assuming and giving an antibiotic. So, um, but a little disclaimer, I mean, I'm not here to pick on um, medical community, I'm not here to pick on pediatricians, I'm not here to pick on antibiotics. Uh, because antibiotics have saved millions of lives, don't get me wrong. Um, and MDs, they are, are pediatricians that are coming from that loving desire to help kids too. But again, if your only tool is a hammer, you start to look at every problem as a nail. So we're going to dig a little bit further into things and get into the cause of some of the ear infections. So uh, really there's three big reasons that um, we find, and the first two that I'm going to talk about are what we find as the biggest thing. The other one kind of can lead into that aspect. And the first one is uh, bad plumbing. Okay, what do I mean by, by bad plumbing? Uh, well, remember I talked about how there's a muscle that actually drains that inner ear and drains that tube um, down into the throat. And that muscle is this fancy work muscle called the tensor belly palatini, um, right? It's a, like I said, fancy little muscle, but it is a very small muscle, but it actually um, attaches into that tube and actually milks that fluid down from the ear down into the throat. Now, issue is, is it gets its nerve supply, so it gets its information to tell it what to do from this top part of the neck. So when that top part of the neck can't, gets stressed or misaligned or um, fixated and that nerve supply gets cut off, that muscle stops working. And what happens when that muscle stops working is fluid starts accumulating in that inner ear and now fluid backs up and becomes stagnant water. And what's attracted to stagnant water? I'm assuming you're probably going to think bacteria and viruses, right? And you're exactly right. So bacteria and viruses, they come and they create an infection. But if we just treat that infection, we're just treating a symptom. We're not treating why that ear infection truly occurred in the first place. So um, what is this stress or this um, fixation that can create in the top part of the neck, or how can that happen? Well, what we call that is subluxation. So fancy word um, that we use, and that is meaning that we have stress fixation, um, misalignment in the top part of the neck. And how does that occur? What we find is a lot of times that is usually coming from the birth process. There's been studies um, that show, there's one study that showed that 99 out of 100 infants that were born had this misalignment in the top part of the neck. So it's a very crucial thing that we um, make sure we address that before ear infections even become an issue. And I mean, um, a couple other things that could 
arise if that subluxation or that misalignment is located in that top part of the neck, and that can be uh, difficulty nursing. They might favor one side more than the other. Um, they're colic, they're a poor sleeper, or constipated, or they have that torticollis where they're kind of bent more to one side and rotated um, and very tense. So those are all different things that can happen when we have this subluxation. So um, we talk about C-sections in, um, in the office with our patients and, and just the birth process in general, but C-sections can be that bigger connection between that birth trauma and ear infections. So, um, I mean, I think the U.S. average is like 40% right now for ear infection or for, um, for how many kids are brought into this world by a C-section. That's astronomically high. I mean, 40%. I mean, World Health Organization says that number shouldn't be any higher than 5 to 10%. So why is it so high? Well, there's multiple reasons. Some of the smaller percentage of the reason is because maybe it's medically necessary. And if it is medically necessary, then that's what C-sections are for. They're there for to save mom or save baby. But that should be the only reason but they're getting thrown out for convenience for maybe the parents because they're not educated on the effects that a C-section could have, on not just on the mom, but on the baby. And then also maybe doctors going on vacation, right? Well, I'm going to be gone on your the week that you're due. So that's, that's just schedule a C-section the week before, right? Um, and that's actually happened. I've heard that story before from I'm up. So it's not that I'm making this stuff up. I can't make this up. Um, it just doesn't seem like it would be believable, but it is. Um, so these are things that can actually happen um, and why birth process is usually the big thing that really connects with ear infections. And it's not just C-sections. It could be a perfect vaginal birth, too, that could be creating this. So um, what happens, though, too, is that... Uh, this kid, this kid gets ear infections, and what happens is their immune system is constantly trying to be worked, and that kicks on the adenoids and the tonsils. And if their immune system is weakened or suppressed, which if they're getting chronic ear infections, I can tell you for a fact, most likely it is, um, then their adenoids and their tonsils are not actually able to work the way that they should, so they stay inflamed for a longer time. And then if they stay inflamed for a longer time, a pediatrician is going to recommend that the tonsils and adenoids get taken out. And that just doesn't make sense because it's not the tonsils and adenoids that are creating that kid to get ear infections. And if the tonsils and adenoids are constantly inflamed, then something's going on, something's wrong with their immune system um, because the tonsils and adenoids should not stay inflamed chronically. So, so they'll get, those will get taken out. And then what will happen is that kids still will get ear infections because, um, again, we just, we've been treating symptoms. And then they'll be on multiple doses of anti antibiotics, and then the pediatrician will say, well, let's send you to an ear, nose, and throat doc. So they will send them to that ear, nose, and throat doc, who will then recommend putting tubes in the ear. So tube surgery for ear infections are actually the number one pediatric surgery. Um, they also cost fifteen to twenty thousand dollars each, and their fifty percent success rate. Up to fifty percent of them have to be redone. Um, and the how ear tubes truly work is. <clears throat> Um, you ever have seen one of those big water jugs um, that have the spigot and then they have the kind of like thing where you can allow air to come in up top? Now, if you have that closed up top, but you release that spigot, it, it'll come out, but not that fast. But then you release that and you open that valve or open the top and now water comes out a lot faster. That's what it is. It works like it forces fluid down, but where does it go? It goes into the throat and it goes down into the lungs. And this is really still not addressing 
the main issue, which is that plumage, plumbing issue. Um, because what it's doing is it's trying to force the fluid down a tube that really should work on its own. It's not addressing that issue where the muscle is actually trying to drain it itself. So uh, what happens is the body, after a while, kicks those tubes out and kid gets ear infections again. And then they probably get another set of tubes, and it's a chronic chain reaction thing. And then um, the kid just is going through so much torture. So the American Academy of Pediatrics um, followed two groups of children for two years. And one group of them got tube surgery, and one group was a placebo. So they, they didn't have anything done. So what they noted in that study was that there was no difference in the number of ear infections between the placebo group and the group that got tube surgery. So what does that mean? It means that ear tubes had no effect on ear infections. You may, as a parent, notice that maybe their ear infections have decreased slightly, but again, they're still getting ear infections. Um, so that is something to be taken into consideration on that aspect. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is just a chain reaction of things um, is the problem number two, which is a neuroimmune dysfunction. So again, this relates to neural, which is our nervous system, which is the system of our body that controls everything in our body. All right. So you're listening to what I'm talking about right now, and that's getting processed through your nervous system. Your heart's beating because your brain is sending a signal through the nervous system telling it to beat. You're breathing because, again, your brain is telling your lungs to breathe um, through that nervous system. And then immune, so neuroimmune. So that nervous system directly controls our immune system. So if our nervous system's stressed, do you think our immune system is stressed? Yes, right? So we get neuroimmune dysfunction. And what does that mean? Well, that really, then we have to, when we talk about the nervous system, we have to relate back to the spine, okay? So the spine is more than just muscles, tendons, and bones. Um, the spine actually houses and protects our nervous system. So that is why, I mean, as a chiropractor, we focus on your spine. If your nervous system was purely in your arm, I would focus on your arm. But it is within our spine, so that's why we focus on this. And let's go back a little bit of a history lesson. And let's go back into kind of how the body develops. So think about it, um, husband and wife, or woman, female, female, male, they come together, and two cells then unite. And they divide actually over one trillion times, right? One trillion times. How smart is one's body? to divide over one trillion times and create one of the greatest gifts in the world, a human being. So when we think about that, um, just two and a half weeks after conception, after those two cells join, the first thing that forms is the brain and the spinal cord. Why do you think that is? Is because for anything else to develop, it needs that connection from the brain and spinal cord. So that's why the brain and the spinal cord are the very first things that are formed because for anything else in the body to function and start developing, it needs that connection through the nervous system. So um, the job of the nervous system is to perceive our environment and coordinate the behavior of all other cells. So what does that mean? It means that on a day-to-day -day basis, we're taking in sensory information from our surrounding environment, and it's going to the brain, where the brain is then coordinating that and processing that information, and it's acting on it. So if we're getting a lot of negative or stress stimulation to the brain, that overwhelms organs and tissues and glands, and that can impact our one's immune system. So um, think of it as the, the nervous system as an air traffic controller, okay? So air traffic controller 
of your body and it has two modes of operation. So the first mode of operation is this gas pedal. So the gas pedal or what we call the sympathetic part of our nervous system. So this is our stress response, okay? So imagine we're just walking in the park and a bear jumps out at us, right? You're gonna, you're gonna get really scared and you're gonna need that stress response. You're gonna either run away real fast or you're gonna fight it. And if you're fighting, I give you props for fighting a bear, but I'm gonna probably run away. Um, so that's what that sympathetic gas pedal part of the nervous system is for. Well, the other part is our brake pedal, our parasympathetic. That is where rest, relax, growth, development, digestion, our immune system, they live there. So it's, I mean, it's definitely important to be able to go back and forth between both of them because if a bear jumps out at us, I don't want to be relaxed. I want to be, have that stress response. But if a bear's not jumping out at me, I want to be relaxed, be, have my immune system functioning, my digestive system functioning the way that it should. So those are the two different parts of the nervous system. And how those can be impacted is by what we call the three T's, traumas, toxins, and thoughts. So physical, chemical, and emotional stresses. So what are these stresses? These can be, this is anything and everything that you face on a daily basis. And this even stems back to even the pregnancy. So, um, I mean, just being in utero for baby, that what the, if mom is stressed, then that baby's nervous system is starting to perceive the environment as a hostile environment. So if mom's pregnancy was very stressful and now baby comes out and is delivered, its first thing is thinking that the environment that it was brought into is a hostile environment because it's been in stress mode that whole time. So then they become very protective of themselves. But, um, I mean, traumas from birth to falls to posture, sitting at your desk like this all day, um, to toxins. What are you putting in your body from um, shots to um, diet to, um, I mean, just from chemicals in the environment to emotional stress, okay? At home, at work, at financial, um, health reasons. I mean, all of that, we're faced with stresses on a daily basis, and it's one thing that we can't get rid of. But what happens is, is those stresses, every time we face a stress, imagine you're, you put your foot further on that gas pedal, okay? And if we don't do anything to kind of relieve or take that foot off the gas pedal, each little stress is going to put it further on the gas pedal and put that throttle on, and what happens is if it's there long enough, it gets stuck. And now you are stuck in that gas pedal mode where your body is under constant stress. So then you can't relax. You can't grow. You can't develop the way that your body was meant to, the way that God designed your body to. So, um, so then what happens is your body's immune system gets suppressed, the digestive system gets suppressed, so then this is where we deal with chronic colds, chronic ear infection, maybe some digestive issues, um, and sometimes symptoms don't always appear right away. So um, Dr. Bruce Lipton, who is a PhD biologist, he stated uh, you can't be in growth and protection at the same time. What does that mean is you can't be on the gas pedal and on the brake pedal at the same time. You're either in one of them. So if these kids get stuck on that gas pedal, then their growth gets um, affected. So uh, that brings us to the third one, which is inflammation from diet. So really this is, again, kind of just building into that toxin aspect of the physical trauma that I talked about. Um, so poor diet and toxins um, from the environment create inflammation within the body, okay? Um, so yeah, I'm talking about all the processed foods um, that are in the center aisles. Um, anything that is coming in a box is processed. 
or a poor diet aspect. And this can lead to mucus production and buildup. All right. Now, when we think about it, mucus is actually one of our body's responses of trying to externalize something harmful. But when um, the body becomes overwhelmed and the mucus production just becomes out of control, then the drainage system becomes impaired and can become overwhelmed and then that can result in some drainage issues. So, um, so one thing that you can do when we talk about diet is limiting your body's exposure to irritants that may um, increase inflammation within your body or may increase this production of mucus. Um, so limiting those ex things, those exposures, um, so that it makes drainage is easier. So what are some of these foods that increase inflammation or increase mucus production? Well, some of them are dairy. So I, I know most of us are living in Wisconsin. We're in dairy country, right? I mean, so we love our cheese. We love our milk. Um, but if you think about it, milk is supposed to be for calves to make huge cows okay so we're, we as humans are drinking something that the ultimate goal of is to produce a big animal a big cow so that's to me it's crazy that i mean our primary thing to drink is milk uh, also sugar so again get into those processed foods um, grains, um, smoking also, but I'm assuming maybe kid probably isn't smoking, but even if they're not smoking, if you're smoking and they're exposed to that, that also can create a lot of irritant, a lot of mucus production, and a lot of um, issues with that drainage. So that is one thing when it comes to diet to limit, especially if your kid is struggling with ear infections. <clears throat> so what, how, how do we in the office determine if we can truly help with ear infections? Well, what we use is this technology that we call Insight Substation. So what this does is it shows us exactly how the nervous system um, is functioning and where we have interference or stress to that nervous system and also lets us know the severity of it. So it lets us know for a fact if we're going to be able to help your kiddo or not. There's no guessing um, when it comes to um, are we going to be able to help. It's not take this antibiotic and if it doesn't work, come back and see, right? Um, we'll be able to give you an answer on if we can help or not. So, um, and how we remove that stress that builds up onto the nervous system is through a very specific, gentle, and effective chiropractic adjustment. Now, we have different ways of adjusting to accommodate to certain individuals, but that is what and how we go about um, helping with ear infections. So that is really all I have for you. I would love to um, talk more, or if you have any questions, uh, post down in the comments section. I'll comment back to it. But otherwise, everyone have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon.